good evening to one and all present here i welcome you all to the technical session and of uag 2021 myself pratipa moderator of this session now i'd like to introduce the chair of the session dr pk gurg he is a professor in the department of civil engineering at iit roorkee and the session is co-chaired by dr suresh mezgu is the uh, associate professor in the cmr college of engineering and technology hyderabad thank you both for accepting our invitation and joining the session uh and the uh, giving a small guidance of the presentation shortly we are giving 10 minutes for each presenters 7 minutes for presentation and 3 minutes for question and answer session the questions will be asked by uh, chair and co-chair initially and the participants question which are posted in the chat box i will be uh, dictating the question so the presenters can answer the, to the questions and one small announcement regarding the publication thing the the best quality papers uh, will be go to pfg journal and the remaining uh, papers will go to the printer as a lecture notes on civil engineering and uh, one more additional information is that extended version of the papers uh, can be submitted in the special issue of a journal of unmanned vehicle system unmanned vehicle system now i request uh, dr pk doctor and dr prish mehru sir to take over the session well um, uh, thank you very much uh, i would Uh, like to welcome my co-chair Dr. Suresh from Hyderabad and uh, all the presenters uh, for this particular session. Um, uh, the only thing which I have to say is, since the time is short for each presentation, and we know that it's very difficult to give a, a longer time period because of the large number of paper we have to accommodate. So kindly adhere to the timing. We know that um, you may not be satisfied with the time frame which is given to you. uh to present uh, your research output uh, what you have done but uh, if you uh, excuse your presentation and say the salient feature and cut down the theory part i think you will be able to finish the presentation on time so with these words you know i wish all the best and uh, you can make the presentation and in case co chair would like to say uh, something to the participants uh, you can thank you sir thank you so much sir yeah. yeah all the best for all the participants same as sad said the objective is what actually the work you have done that you should present okay all the best to all of you thank you so much so first presenter can start the presentation i think we are moving in that same sequence the which we have the paper with us influence of european uas regulation on image acquisition for 3d building modeling this is from poland yes sir yeah first presentation uh hello ladies and gentlemen my name is grzegorz gabara and i'm from warsaw university of technology in poland I'm going to tell you about the influence of European US regulation on image acquisition for 3D building modeling. I've divided my presentation into three parts. Firstly, I will tell you about 3D modeling. Secondly, I will go to the US regulation and then I will show a comparison of limitation of both old aviation regulation and new UA regulations. So let's go to the main part of my presentation. At the beginning, I'd like to remind the types of level Level of detail. The lot zero is the contour of the building, a footprint. Lot one is the extruded lot zero, a box. Lot two includes roof shapes, uh, changes. Lot three additionally provides information about architectural details of facades, while lot four contains lot three with indoor features. As we know, those models could be generated based on data acquisition, uh, data acquired with uh, different techniques. Currently, we use the terrestrial laser scanning, terrestrial imagery, airborne laser scanning, and airborne imagery, manned and unmanned. On this slide, we see an overview of some typical issues related to different methods. On the left upper corner, we see some holes in 3D model done by occlusions. This is the typical problem uh, of using TLS and terrestrial imagery for reconstruction of whole buildings. In the right upper corner, we see typical occlusions for airborne imagery. In left corner, the typical problem with 3D reconstruction based on other images is presented. I mean, issue with holes on walls and wall verticality. All the last one uh, and the last one uh, is the problem with the homogeneous structure of the building uh, facades. 
as we can see, tie points are located only on one part of images, which provides some problems with reconstruction in the form of holes and or accuracy errors. Those errors could be minimized by adding some new strips of images. As we can see, additional image with different tile angle could do the job. It is related with more tile point areas and better geometry. The last fig uh, figure on this slide. And that is why usage of UAS in 3D modeling became so popular. But as we know, the UAS flight mission must uh, to be performed according to the aviation law, which for every UA country have been changed. To show what was changed the, uh, context of 3D, in the context of 3D building modeling, I will use Poland regulation as an example, before, before UAS pilots were using national regulation in each UA country. US regulation for Poland were published by Minister of Infrastructure. Currently, from January 1st, the Commission delegated regulation is in force. Now I will make an overview of what are the changes and what reminded the same. Both regulation have limitation related to geographical zones. The same zones as before with similar limitation, but different division and names. The map shows current zones with limitation. Because of the time limit, I will not describe the zones, as it's a common feature for both regulation. And now we will see the differences. First of all, U.S. flight mission classification. Old rules used uh, shame based on commercial and non-commercial type of flights. And then the weight and the, the type of U.S. were taken into account. Currently, the division is based on a risk assessment, and there are three categories of flight missions, open, specified, and certified. The first category is related with the lowest risk of flight mission, and the last is the most dangerous mission. Open category is divided into three subcategories. A1 mean uh, flight over people, A2 close to people, and A3 away from people. Uh, in all rules, most of the limitations were related to geographical zones, but there were some additional points related to different type of flight in case of data acquisition for 3D building modeling. The max height of flight is 150 meters or to the highest points of the near object. And the uh, left side of the slide uh, shows four cases of such limitations. In the third case, there is no limitation of distance of UAS weight. However, for commercial flight missions, UAS pilot needs unmanned uh, aerial vehicle operator uh, certificate, which defines the UAS type and weight range. To get the certificate, a person has to complete training performed by the competent authority and pass theoretical and practical exams. The beyond visual line of sight operation could be performed only by trying to UAS pilot with BVLOS certificate. Taking into account data acquisition for high accuracy 3D building modeling for non-commercial purposes, I mean enthusiasts who do charity flights or gathering data for self-training in 3D modeling, the flight could be done using DJI Mavic 2 Air. Uh, of course, the flight mission could be done also using heavier UAS like DJI Phantom 4 Pro or UNEC H520, but in that case, the ground sample distance is about 27 millimeters, which means that accuracy error of 3D reconstruction is about five centimeters. In UA rules, the new thing is that uh, all UAS heavier than uh, 250 grams have to be registered and the max flight height is 120 meters. The new categories have also new limitation. The description is on the right side of the slide. For existing UAS uh, that do not comply with requirements of C1 to C4 UAS categories, which are described in additional annex with UAS requirements, the transitional period of 30 months is established, which starts one year after the date of entry into force of UA Commission delegated regulations. So the UAS with takeoff mass lower than 500 grams could be used in the A1 subcategory. In the case of UAS with a weight limitation of two kilograms, the minimum horizontal safety distance from people is 50 meters. Uh, the specified categories, requirements, and uh, uh, are described on the uh, right of the side of the slide. Uh, in order to analyze the limitation of each category and subcategories, popular UAS were matched to each of them. In A1, it is possible to use DJ Mavic Mini equipped with a 20 megapi uh, 12 megapixel camera. It is not a high grade tool 
for image acquisition, but for end users could be fine. In A2, the DJI Phantom 4 Pro or Mavic 2 Pro could be used. Taking into account the transitional period, the minimal value GSD of about uh, 14 millimeters could be obtained. In A3, a subcategory, LUAS mentioned before can be used, but because of horizontal safe distance, 150 meters to people, the acquisition of images in some cases is useless. The obtained GSD will be about five centimeters, so comparable to GSD obtained in manned airborne missions. And as we remember from literature, the accuracy error of 3D reconstruction is about two times of GSD. The specified category should be compared with commercial flight uh, uh, missions, all TIS operation rules. For both, special training is needed and to obtain the certificate, the theoretical and practical exams must be passed. Also, the practical, the price of the old weight category training is comparable to one standard scenario training. To conclude, in the case of image acquisition for 3D building modeling, the UAS pilot had more comfort, fewer limitations, wider access to sensor, and fewer formalities in previous aviation roles. Thank you for attention. Yeah, well, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Um, in fact, uh, I would like to know one thing, whether these regulations, uh, uh, the people are happy now, the uh, drone flyers are happy with these regulations, new regulations. They are, uh, um, they are liberal now as compared to the previous one. Uh, it depends because uh, the new regulations uh, looks uh, to risk assessment and the previous one uh, looks to make missions uh, uh, in whole area. So uh, there were uh, no formalities like uh, registration QAS pilot, registration QAS operator, registration uh, UAS and uh, registration missions. Now, in the new uh, rules, we have to do it. Uh, also, the limitation with uh, the height of flights uh, is uh, different uh, and uh, different division of uh, UAS. So, in my opinion, better rules were better, but uh, uh, those new rules are, on, uh, are enforced in each EU country. So, uh, it's one rule for uh, the whole Europe. Uh, before we have uh, different uh, rules in different countries. So uh, we see the advantages and disadvantages of new uh, rules. Yeah, that's right. But uh, you know, the people safety and uh, security and private safety is very, very important. Yeah. Whenever the drone is flown. Yeah, that's very good. Wonderful paper. Um, yes. uh, now, uh, Dr. Suresh or audience, you know. Yeah. And. Uh, just uh, it's a good uh, work what you have done. It's a good paper. And just my question is small question. That is the visual line of sight for A2. How you define that? Uh, could you repeat? Visual line of sight for A2. Ah, uh, visual line of sight. It's uh, about uh, 500 meters from the person who just uh, pilot the US. So. Um, of course, it depends of the uh, UIS which you use, because uh, if uh, the UIS is bigger, you will see him uh, far more. Uh, and uh, uh, when I said it's 500 meters, I uh, thought about uh, the Phantom Pro, uh, 4 Pro or something like that, or uh, mentioned uh, before UNEC H520. Uh, you will see the point on the clouds. Uh, and uh, in, in terminology, the visual line of sight is the point where you see the UAS. So uh, that's the uh, deadline. Uh, I mean, uh, the line uh, where uh, uh, the rules uh, cut off uh, the range of the UAS um, uh, distance. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, audience, if there is any question? Sir, we haven't received any questions from our audience, so we can move to the next question. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We move to the next one. Second one, which is on the forest fire detection from UAV by Dr. B. Chandramohan.
Yeah, good afternoon to all. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, very much. Yeah, so thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, my uh, presentation is on the forest fire detection from uh, UAV images using the fusion of uh, retrained mobile CNN architecture. So forest, uh, my uh, presentation outline is uh, like this. So what are uh, forest fires? Some uh, brief statistics about forest fires, the objectives of uh, the proposed work, and then uh, the data set that I've used for uh, uh, fire classification and uh, nat from natural images. Then what are various mobile CNN architectures? And the proposed algorithm results I conclude, and then uh, the last one is uh, the references. So uh, uh, forest fires are very common in uh, forests, and every year more than millions of people are evacuated evacuated due to this uh, global uh, wildfire. In fact, even in 2020 itself, 52,113 wildfire cases have been reported globally, and a lot of land got burned. Compared to 2019, in fact, it got doubled. <clears throat> in India itself. In 2019, more than 30,000 forest fires were reported. So mo monitoring this uh, forest fire, uh, forest uh, areas for uh, wildfire identification is a tough task. So obviously UAV is uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones are uh, 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 better tools for uh, monitoring uh, and then detecting the fires in the deeper forests, uh, accurate and inexpensive also. So the objective of this work is to propose a deep learning algorithm using mobile CNN architectures rather than conventional CNN architectures so that uh, the model is uh, deployable in the UAV or like, for example, a drone. Because the mobile CNN architectures, they require uh, <clears throat> fewer computations and easy to deploy. The inferencing is very fast and the classification accuracy with the proposed approach is going to be higher. Why uh, the reason? Because uh, most of the uh, deep learning algorithms are quite expensive in terms of computational and then uh, inferencing uh, of uh, uh, side also because they take a lot of uh, time. So this is the forest fire data set that I've used. Uh, in fact, this is not so popular uh, because we are very uh, almost one or two forest fire data sets are only available. The data set that I've chosen is two, uh, 2096 images fire class images uh, 1048 and no fire class 1048. So some natural images are shown at the bottom and images which are uh, having fire in the <clears throat> forest are shown at the top. Mobile CNN architectures are the CNN or convolutional neural network architectures targeted for mobile devices like Android or iOS devices. They are weight, lightweight. They require very less number of trainable parameters and uh, uh, why uh, I have chosen mobile CNN architectures? The reason is the deeper the CNN, usually the accuracy is higher, but uh, the, uh, the computationality is expensive. So conventional CNN architectures like AlexNet, VGC16, VGC19, very tough to uh, deploy on a mobile platform or uh, for example, UAV because of the constraints on the battery power and then the, the time and the processor speed. So here, the remedy that is proposed here is to use mobile CNN architecture and then fuse the features from mobile CNN architectures. So here I have used, uh, these are the architectures that I have selected, I just to have a quick glance like uh, SqueezeNet, MobileNet version one, version two, MNASNet A1, MobileNet V3, SqueezeNext, and then uh, ShuffleNets, DiceNets, uh, ESPNets, ConvenceNets, GhostNet like that. I have not used GhostNet anyway. Uh, efficient net and then mixed net. So these are all mobile CNN architectures. One key factor here is the number of trainable parameters uh, is very less, except the first one. The first one is a, not a mobile architecture. It's in fact a conventional architecture, which requires 23 million parameters, but the rest of all the architectures is just less than 10 million parameters. So this is the proposed methodology that I've uh, used. The data set is split into train and test. Then uh, I have chosen four mobile CNN architectures. Uh, all the mo four mobile CNN architectures are already trained on the ImageNet data set. But that means pre-trained CNN architectures. The features are extracted from the last pooling layer of these uh, four CNN architectures. And then all the features are concatenated and then given to an SVM classifier. This is a binary SVM, a binary support vector machine classifier because the problem is to <clears throat> classify the image having fire and the image having no fire. Uh, that's the only thing. So that's why the problem is a binary problem. 
So that's why I've applied a binary SVM classifier. Then once the SVM classifier gets trained, then I have given the S set feature vector, then the, the classification accuracy is uh, updated. So the splitting that I have chosen is both 80, 20, and then uh, uh, 10, 90. So I have used uh, condensed nets, dice nets. So these are the architectures that I have used. And the second column shows the feature vector size. So the as small as, for example, 190 to 128, the dice net, for example. Dice net is dimension-wise uh, uh, convolution uh, you know, uh, network uh, CNN uh, architecture. And then the, the classification accuracy obtained, mean classification accuracy obtained as shown in the right column. This experiment I have repeated 10 times to make it more general, because once the data gets shuffled, uh, the train and the test data, uh, the, uh, the convolution neural network may go for uh, overfitting. So to avoid that overfitting, I have shuffled the data and then tested the algorithm. So these are the uh, mobile CNN architectures I have used. Just to have a comparison, I have kept ResNet 50. ResNet 50 is not a mobile CNN architecture as I have stated in the previous slide, which requires 2048 uh, feature. This is the feature vector size. Now uh, with 80% train and 20% test uh, over 10, iterations when dice net, mix net, and the Facebook net, mobile net v3 large. Mobile net v3 large is the latest, uh, I mean, latest in the sense to 2019. That is the architecture used for uh, mobiles. <clears throat> so uh, by concatenating the features from these four uh, mobile uh, CNN architectures, the mean classification accuracy obtained is 98.2. So uh, iteration wise, when we see here classification accuracy per iteration, it's more, uh, I mean, there's no problem at all uh, with reference to overfitting of the model. There's no overfitting with this. So that ensures that irrespective of the shuffling, the uh, model is going to give you uh, better accuracy. That's the reason. And the, But the feature vector size is 5,264. So the, uh, the feature vector size is obviously larger than the individual feature vectors. And this is even with the 10% train and 90% test. So this is the worst case. When you have very less number of samples, so the training is less with only 10%, uh, still the mean classification accuracy obtained is 97.1 by uh, concatenating all the features from the four selected uh, uh, CNN, mobile CNN uh, architectures. And when we see here, this plot shows the individual uh, uh, mobile CNN architectures and then uh, the classification accuracy of the computer. Yeah. Right. Mobile CNN, the fused CNN architectures, the blue color indicates that it is much higher than uh, by the other four uh, individual uh, architectures like DiceNet, MixNet, FBNet, and then MobileNet uh, V3. So these are the other performance met metrics that are conventionally used for assessing a binary classifier like uh, true positives, false positives, false negatives. Here, the statistics that I have given here is for the 10 iterations, the accuracy is 98.2 with an F measure of 0.982. So uh, it is able to classify uh, much better compared to uh, the conventional architectures, which are deeper and then wider. So the confusion matrix that is shown here, 98.8 is the peak value because uh, it is, uh, the experiment is repeated 10 times so we'll get one time uh, the highest value that is shown here 98.8, but the uh, average value is 98.21 with 80% train and then 20% test. So I've used the SVM classifier with a box constraint of one. These are the specifications of the classifier that I've chosen, a linear kernel. I've used a PyTorch framework in the Google Collab environment and the inferencing took almost uh, within no time, just uh, within few seconds. Uh, the inference is, uh, so it's very fast. So it, it's very fast. And then the trainable parameters are less than 10 millions. So uh, battery wise, uh, it is easy. So it doesn't take uh, much power from the battery because the number of flops also is very, very less with this. So the conclusion is uh, uh, by using mobile CNN architectures, uh, effectively one can classify the fire images from natural images from the UAV image data set. And the further improvement is possible with uh, tuning the features, uh, selecting the better features and reducing the features. I hope uh, uh, the, the, the combined model uh, uh, should do uh, much better compared to the, what I have uh, suggested here. So the pro proposed model requires very few parameters and it is easy to deploy on UAVs like uh, drones for classifying the uh, images from fire versus uh, no fire.
images. These are the references that I have uh, used. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Mohan. In fact, it was a very, very uh, informative, very useful kind of a study. I can see a few questions in the chat box. So I will yeah, not sure. uh, like to interfere, ask any question straight away. I request uh, to ask the question from the chat box. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first question is, how did you handle different shapes of feature vector simultaneously in your final SVM classification? Or by the time all extracted features were fused, they were padded to the same shape? Uh, no, uh, I don't get you. Feature vector is calculated straight away from the mobile CNN architecture. It's a pre-trained CNN architecture, madam. Uh, sir, we got the question. This is from uh, Chintan. Mr. Chintan. Okay. Uh, and sir, remaining questions, if we have a time at, uh, in after the presentation, all the presentation, we can discuss that later too, because already yeah, we have yeah, sure, time limit, sir. Uh, my and sir, one more one question. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, please, sir. Please. So what are the library, means what are the libraries you have used? That is one. And one more important question is, what is the size of the data set which you have taken? Size of the so, data set is 2096 images, sir. 2096. Yeah, 1048 in five case. 1048 in natural images. Natural images. Okay. Yeah. What is the spatial resolution? Have you identified it there? Spatial resolution. Yeah, spatial resolution is 577 by 577. But the, when, I, when I use a CNN architecture, I have to reduce it because the model is already mm -hmm. uh, having a fixed size. For example, 224 by 224 is a common uh, uh, value. That is fine. And what are the what is the exact spectral resolution for that? 224 by 224. 224 by 224. Pixels, 224 by 224 pixel image. So only pixels you're talking, not in yeah, terms I'm talking of spectral. Pixels. Spectral yeah. you're not talking, right? Yeah, this is visible spectrum only. Only visible spectrum. Yeah, yeah, this is, all these images are uh, collected uh, in visible region only. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. It was a, a wonderful study because we have, you know, similar kind of a forest fire problem in uh, several uh, hilly regions of the country, including Uttarakhand. So this kind of study okay. are very useful. So thank you. Thanks a lot. We move to the third uh, presentation. Yeah, of current practices in space drawn for digital soil mapping review by Abdel Krim from Morocco. Uh, sir, I think there is some issues with the, his uh, audio. Okay. So we will play the uh, recorded video given sure. by him. Sure. Yeah. And sir, I, I also like to give one, an announcement to the participants. They can post their question and answer in the QA and session of the Kubilo platform for other uh, participants on the individual. Yeah, absolutely fine. Hello, sir. Is the okay. audio is audible? No. Uh, just a minute, sir. I have to take play. Thank you for giving me this opportunity yeah. to present my work, which is about current practices in space. Drones for Digital Soil Mapping Review. The drone use has become widespread in agriculture. The most common role of drones in agriculture is as a remote sensing platform to assess and monitor crops, but also some emerging agricultural applications such as digital soil mapping. Uh, uh, several different drone design and sensor types are used each with its associated advantages and limitations. Many predictive models are applied to predict soil attributes maps. This work provides an overview of the development of digital soil mapping using drones imagery and predictive methods to assess the quality prediction. In the last years, there are many article publications 
using drones, especially in earth science. There has been an increase in development in platform and sensors. The main concept of digital soil mapping can be summarized in the following figure. We start by collecting data from field and preparing coverage, uh, which can be derived from remote sensing data, including drone imageries. And then, and then we overlay the root data with the covariates to produce a regression matrix and use this matrix to fit predictive models by using different machine learning algorithm and using the best fitted model to predict values at locations and the final step is to compare the prediction with the observed value. The preliminary results from this literature review uh, show that drones have been used for different types of applications for digital soil mapping, such as soil organic matter and soil organic carbon, uh, soil moisture, con moisture content, soil texture and salinity, and soil sampling, phosphorus and other digital soil mapping applications. Also, the use of different predictive models such as steep regression, partially square regression, structural equation modeling, and geostatistical methods such as Cregan with external drift. Also, there has been the use of different machine learning algorithms uh, such as artificial neural networks, extreme learning machine, random forest, support vector regression, and cubist. Now let me show you an example of the use of drones in digital soil mapping applications. This example is from Zigzilla All. They have used different sensors and different remote sensing platforms, hyper airborne, multispectral spectral satellite and drone imagery. They have also used different machine learning algorithms and the cubist gives the most accurate prediction and the final conclusion is that drones and freely available satellite multispectral data can represent an alternative cost effective data a source for remote digital soil mapping on the local scale. Another application of using drones in digital soil mapping which is a soil sampling design after collecting imagery and producing a biosoil composite image, they have applied a segmentation to generate different regions and, and generating a walk route and then used these data to collect samples from field. Then they have produced a phosphorus content digital map. This is a summary of using drones in digital soil mapping, especially for soil organic matter and soil organic carbon. To conclude, drone applications have gained more interest in digital soil mapping in the last years. Machine learning algorithms give more precise prediction of soil attributes using drone imagery. Drone imagery with free available satellite data can be used to deal with precision agriculture. The future of uh, this work will include the following topics, developing an extensive discussion on the drone types and sensors as a special resolution, uh, comparing the results with similar studies use using satellites and airborne imagery, and including other soil study topics. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Alte. Well, if there is any question, you can post it and uh, uh, the question we can send it to the author or reply. So we move to the next uh, presentation, which is on RCC structure deformation and uh, damage quantification using UAV image correlation by Dr. K. Kumar from NIT Warangal.
morning everyone i am k kumar as a scholar uh, working under the guidance of dr m chc and dr k venkat reddy from manati wagar and my topic is on uh, rcc pitch deformation and damage quantification using unmanned aerial vehicle image correlation so coming to the introduction uh, rcc structures are designed for uh, specific uh, serviceability uh, lifespan so due to the functionality they deteriorate on repetitive loading in another uh, environmental conditions also so uh, as per the guidelines issued by federal highway administration a bridge needs to be uh, inspected for every 2 to 3 years based upon the age of uh, structure so for the inspection there are wide range of contact and ut techniques uh, uh, but there are only few remote sensing sensors and non contact methods to inspect the structures so these are the remote sensing platforms available for uh, uh, bridge monitoring so the platforms are uh, based on the operational uh, divided based on the operational attributes for satellite imaging uh, you can get the high resolution rgb image uh, which can be used for damage quantification uh, sorry uh, uh, during the times of natural calamities and aircrafts can produce uh, multi high resolution multi spectral and rgb image and uv is uv can produce uh, uh, rgb laser uh, multi spectral uh, and uh, thermal images also that is similar to terrestrial ca cameras and the robots can produ produce in addition uh, to that uh, 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 robots can produce a uh, 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 similar data sets uh, so uh, by uav uav can even uh, check the uh, bridge decks beneath so coming to the uh, image correlation what is image correlation image correlation additional image correlation is one of the non contact entity methods which is used for quantifying the deformation of any specimen so uh, by uav uh, to measure the deformation dac requires pre loading uh, pre loading image and the post loading image so it requires an acquiring two or more images correlating them based on the statistical principles to extract the displacement and strain fields so artificially induces speckles uh, speckles are the black dots which you can see in the image acts as information carrier so dsc measurement is based on tracking the cluster of speckles and uh, uh, in the deformed and reference image through polar correlation functions uh, uh, speaking the critical appraisal so uh, there is a need of rapid risk free and cost effective method to monitor it uh, monitor the and document the damage of bridge by ensuring minimal impact on traffic flow there is also requirement for an alternate equation platform that can be mobile and power through inaccessible location to obtain the near perpendicular images by minimizing the picture rack and to improve the quality of data and results so uh, the unmanned aerial vehicle image correlation that is mounted in a uav found up as an effective tool to monitor the bridge even beneath the deck tolls so these are my objectives uh, Uh, laboratory studies are performed uh, for DAC using drone image and along with the digital image uh, at the same time, and the proposed method is validated uh, on existing bridge. So uh, coming to the methodology, specimens of uh, beams are prepared and the speckle pattern is applied, and these are calibrated on UTM uh, by by also uh, applying the straight strain gauge beneath the beam. and for image you can see the drone along with this camera is both are uh, uh, applied and the displacement uh, displacements are calculated using a dsc software and uh, the strain uh, data sets uh, sorry uh, graphs are plotted so specimen preparation uh, three beams of m20 grade uh, with a length of 1.2 meter and depth 200 m 200 mm and 150 mm with We uh, are along with uh, two 16 mm diameter bars at the bottom and uh, two 12 mm diameter bars at the top. Uh, is uh, fixed in it, and uh, the beams are white washed, uh, and the mid span of the beam is drawn with Prana speckles. You can see the black dots on the beam. In the laboratory loading conditions, uh, 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 actually uh, done like this. Uh, specimen is loaded loaded uh, loaded to UTM with uh, two roller supports on the end. And two point bending test is uh, applied uh, on the beam with the two point loads at exactly uh, uh, 100 mm apart from center, uh, and the dial gauges are applied uh, at the bottom of the beam to quantify the deflection of it. And you can see the graphical view of how the loading is applied and how the bending is done. Uh, this is the image equation done. Uh, you can see the DSLR image uh, uh, with the 
prior to loading and post loading after the failure of DB is obtained. Similarly, UAV also, UAV also pre and post uh, loading uh, images also occurred. And uh, this is the workflow of the DHC software and for uh, version 1.2. Uh, we need to give the inputs of uh, reference image that is prior loading image and post loading image and region of interest is uh, selected that will be uh, uh, exactly at the center of the beam for more definition conditions and the DSC parameters are set and uh, reg uh, region of interest for uh, selecting the seeds. Seeds are like uh, you can actually select the cluster of uh, speckles which are applied, the black dots which are applied. The cluster should be uh, uh, Minimum three, four seeds should be, should be selected on the beam. And uh, with the help of seeds, you can calculate the displacements and the strains also can be calculated. These are the outputs. You can see the output which was uh, which was obtained from DIC uh, processing software. Uh, you can see from here the stress zones, maximum deflection, uh, maximum deflection values, and minimum deflection values also given uh, in the report card available uh, uh, beneath it. The proposed method, whatever uh, tested in the lab, is applied and evaluated on the bridge uh, available nearby. So this is the bridge available uh, at Kadipkonda, Varangal, Telangana. This is a railover bridge which was constructed 25 years back. Uh, it is also on the main state highway with heavy free traffic. Uh, so the other, other selected this uh, to evaluate uh, the uh, lab studies, whatever I have done. So this is the uh, bridge UAV image equation. Uh, the bridge is uh, actually 5, uh, 5 10 meters in length, but the span of uh, deck is uh, 12 meters uh, from support to support. Uh, the height of the uh, bridge is around 6.5 meters, and the deck sub uh, thickness is uh, 0.6 meters along with beam. So the UV means are obtained from 3 meters, uh, 3 meters uh, distance to cover the entire uh, deck, uh, deck span. So prior to the vehicle passage, you can see the images obtained and uh, during the vehicle passage, the images obtained for uh, DLC analysis. Uh, and uh, for a damage quantification, the image UV is also used for damage quantification. So these were the damages uh, which uh, UV can obtain like uh, during the inspection studies, uh, cracks and uh, spalling and uh, uh, the, uh, all over uh, the joints also. So this is the load deflection curve, which was obtained uh, from DIC, UAV DIC, and uh, DSL DIC, and Dial DS2 compared. And uh, coming to the bridge deformation analysis, uh, uh, the DIC is applied. And it is observed that uh, during the vehicle passage, when it uh, at the center of the beam, the deflection is around uh, 1.71 mm. You can see the graph. Yeah, already seven minutes completed, find up. Uh, so, coming to the conclusions, it's under, uh, understood that DSC uh, studies can also be performed with the help of UAV embedded with gimbal. Uh, gimbal uh, actually stabilizes the image, so gimbal is must for uh, UAV studies. And uh, it, uh, it is also observed that uh, based on the laboratory uh, uh, studies, UAV IC deformation results is varying with 19% with the dial gauge observations and 14% with the DSLR uh, study mode observations. Uh, so the proposed method can also be used in uh, can be uh, can be performed in uh, field, but at low windy conditions only uh, while using quarter cropper. Uh, this can be uh, achieved better with uh, while using octa cropper. Uh, so for improved stability and the long flight durations. From the findings, it's also evident that the evaluated bridges damage partially and need maintenance. These are my references. Yes, very good, uh, Mr. K. Kumar. Uh, uh, actually, in our country also, we have very old bridges where uh, deformation is taking place when they have load passes. So these kind of study will be helpful yes. to take some retrofitting kind of a work or demolish the bridge and construct the entirely new bridge. Yes. Um, there uh, is a question in the chat box. Um, can you please read the question? Yes. Chat box. Uh, yes, sir. I'm reading yeah, the question, sir. Uh, since the daughter pattern is the quite close to have accuracy, it seems accurate. But another question is how the is that how did you overcome the tolerance from UAV itself? Since UAV has its own vibration. Yeah, that's what uh, I, I mean. I mean, addressed uh, without gimbal, if you are going to work, uh, you cannot achieve much. Uh, so, while compared to the DSLR and uh, 
the UAV acquired images, there is 19% of uh, uh, accuracy missing. So uh, that that need to be compatible. So if you are having uh, it, it actually the UAV imagery actually acts as a preliminary estimate of uh, deflections. So instead of going for direct NDTs uh, with much more cost. Uh, you can directly go with an uh, UAV and check for the deflection using DLC software and plan for the in-contact entity method. So this actually reduces the cost uh, cost for inspecting studies. The same uh, person like Vikash asks the question again, how near are we supposed to fly towards the structure? Yeah, it would be better if it is uh, one meter uh, from the structures, but when uh, uh, you should have a wide angle camera, uh, so, uh, if you are not having a wide angle camera uh, with my condition, I, I have known the uh, drone from three meters so that then only I can cover the entire uh, span of the beam. So, if you are having a wide angle camera, one meter would be uh, having a high resolution image so that better uh, results can be uh, given. Okay, very good. So, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any, any other question? Yeah, no, sir. No. No, thanks a lot. We move to the next presentation on deep learning based improved automatic building extraction from open source unmanned aerial vehicle imagery by Chintan B. Maniar from IIRS Theradun. Uh, so is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, I'll start with the presentation, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'll be presenting my work on uh, deep learning based uh, improved building extraction on an open source high resolution UAV image data set. So, uh, uh, importance of building extraction is very widespread in uh, remote sensing features, uh, feature extraction altogether, uh, right from urban mapping and monitoring to disaster management, pre and post damage assessment cadastral mapping, et cetera. Uh, the primitive methods of building extraction, they include texture-based analysis or morphological uh, operations, which include uh, index-based extraction, such as uh, NDBI, NDBI, normalized difference building index. And a lot of times NDVI and NDWI have also been used to isolate the building class. Apart from that, segmentation techniques are also very prominent when it comes to feature extraction and uh, specifically building extraction segmentation is basically uh, grouping together pixels based on some similarity condition now uh, two known challenges in building extraction have been instant segmentation and shadow handling instant segmentation is separately extracting two buildings which are closed very uh, which are placed very close to each other and not extracting it as a single building and shadow handling the prominent problem in shadow handling is not misclassifying an area which is under shadow as a building. Now, uh, recently, uh, a lot of remote sensing applications have been addressed by deep learning methods. Since they are very strong and robust and they have very good represent, uh, representational learning techniques. Uh, fully convolutional networks to be specific have shown amazing results when it comes to building extraction and they have overcome most of the instant segmentation and shadow issues. However, in deep learning also, there are challenges when it comes to buildings which have irregular shapes or blurred boundaries. Also, if the uh, data or the image is spectrally restricted, uh, then the, the deep learning model might face some challenges. So in, in this study, we try to specifically address these objectives under the deep learning umbrella. Uh, we try to improve the building extraction in terms of irregular shapes, blurred boundaries, and very less spectral channels. And we use ensemble learning and uh, ensemble learning uh, architectures and transfer le learning to uh, gauge the building extraction. And finally, we compare the results uh, for this same data set, our result with the other benchmarks for the same data set. So we are using the INRIA UAV data set. It is a 30 centimeter spatial resolution. It is only three, it is having only three spectral channels, red, green, and blue. And one image size is 5,000 or 5,000 pixels. It is captured from across five cities in the US and Austria countries. So there is very high variance in terms of the building pattern, building density, uh, shadow uh, and non-shadow areas, et cetera. And this is an orthorectified imagery. So UAV dataset, of course, has its own advantages of uh, quality and high spatial resolution over the uh, prominent satellite data sets. So uh, for data preparation, uh, one the thing is one tip of the data set is 5,000 cross 5,000 pixels. 
So what we are doing is we are chipping it out into a, a small sized uh, image of 224 cross 224. And now when we do so, what happens is that these small chips, uh, a lot of chips would be like they do not contain any building at all. So we apply a filter called a high label filter, which will uh, uh, filter out the chips which do not have any buildings at all. So this is done to avoid the bias in the data set so that there is no issue of overfitting or underfitting while training the model. So finally, after pre-processing, we have roughly uh, 27,000 uh, chips for uh, after like the cutting, cutting process. Out of that, roughly 23,000 are for training and 4,000 are for testing purpose. So this is the proposed architecture. We are using a, a deeper network uh, and it is a combination of two networks. We are using ResNet 34. It is a pre-trained architecture uh, on ImageNet and we are using UNet, which is an FCN. So the resultant architecture is ResUNet, and uh, this is the training methodology. So basically, after we initialize the ResUNet architecture with the pre-trained weights from ImageNet, we train for building extraction for 30 epochs by using the concept of transfer learning, and then we evaluate and validate the model performance. The model was activated uh, by the ReLU function, linear, uh, uh, rectified linear unit, and the optimization was done using the Adam optimizer. So. Uh, what we have tried to do unique in this uh, deep learning model is that we are trying to use a unique sort of loss. Uh, loss is a basically function which is used to train the network and with every increase in epoch, the loss has to decrease. So there are two types of losses, binary cross entropy loss and the dice loss. So BC loss will uh, focus on the edge while the dice loss will focus on the region. So when we combine both of this, it becomes very helpful when we want to uh, account for the irregular shape as well as the blurred boundary. And then hence we are using a combo loss, which is basically a sum of both these losses. And these graphs basically show how the loss decreases as the training progresses and how the accuracy and intersection over union, a unit to gauge building extraction increases with the accuracy. Moving to the results, here we can see the input image. This is the ground truth, this is the predicted output, and this is the evaluation, basically the confusion map. So here we can see that buildings with irregular shapes have also been extracted very nicely with a very occasional false positives. And different patterns of buildings also we can see here, we can see that instance segmentation is also being done for closely placed buildings. Moving on, uh, buildings placed in a vegetative area are also being extracted very nicely with uh, the preservation of the spatial patterns. And uh, with different, different classes in the background are also not affecting the classification as such. Uh, so here uh, we, uh, we use accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, uh, branching factor, miss factor, detection percentage, and intersection over union to gauge the building extraction. We can see most of the cases accuracy is above uh, 90% and uh, F1 score is also above 85% and IOU is also above 80%. And since the INRIA dataset is captured from five different cities, we also do a city-wise analysis. So we observe that two cities, specifically Kitsap and Chicago, they are missing out a lot on buildings. Our model is missing out on extracting a lot of buildings. So we identify a very prominent issue, a new issue that, was, uh, that has not been identified before, which is uh, uh, basically, uh, if the buildings are under shadows, we address the issue that a shadowy area should not be misclassified as a building. But however, our model faced a lot of challenges if a building was under a shadow. So if a building was under a shadow, the model was not extracting that building and that led to a very high false positive rate. So here we can see all the yellow colors false positive. But however, uh, given these challenges also, if we compare the overall metrics of our proposed model with the other state of the art models for the same data set, uh, we can see that the accuracy that we are achieving is 96.5%, while the best one is 96.6%. Uh, the mean F1 score, uh, we have tried to improve from 83 to 88%. And the mean intersection over union metric, we have tried to improve from 77 to 80%. Uh, hence, uh, the proposed ResUnit architecture, basically it is an ensemble sort of deep learning architecture in which we are initializing one deep learning architecture with the weights of another pre-trained network. So it is uh, helping to improve the building extraction. And it is uh, successful in addressing the popular issues of irregular shape blurred boundaries and doing well in a spectrally restricted data set of only R, G, and B channels also. And uh, it, it also did not classify the shadowy regions as buildings. However, it faced challenges for buildings which are already under the shadows, which, which can be a potential uh, research aspect. Uh, and despite all the challenges, the overall performance of the proposed model is at par and in a few cases also better than the most benchmark for this data set. Um, thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah, well, very uh, useful uh, study and uh, there is a need to carry out or develop the methods which are more automated in nature, can extract uh, buildings and other 
parameters from the satellite image. Uh, one question uh, which comes to my mind is that uh, uh, when you uh, calculate the accuracy, when you compute the accuracy, uh, did you see the number number of buildings which have been identified correctly or the area of the building? Which parameter has been used to compute the accuracy? Uh, sir, actually, the, it is it is based on the area of the buildings as we are calculating the accuracy directly from the pixel. So we can simply multiply the number of pixel with the uh, spatial resolution of the data set and we are getting it in terms of the area. Right. So area is the basis in your study. Uh, yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, any any parts, any participants, Dr. Suresh, any questions? Yes, sir. Okay. And what is the, uh, yeah, good. And what is the computation time uh, processing? Uh, sir, the processing time uh, is a, a little higher. I have trained for 30 epochs on my uh, local machine only, which is uh, no, uh, like, I uh, don't have the luxury of high RAM or GPU. So it took around 12 hours for me to train for 30 epochs. But if we train it on uh, yeah. uh, even Colab, then it will be done on uh, uh, done in less than four hours, sir. That is the main problem because when we do with the images, especially the completion time is taking. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. That's what this. There is a question from the Poland, uh, uh, Mr. Yes, Gabraya. Please, uh, can you read this question? Yes, sir. I'm. Yeah, please. Does the clipping of image include an additional boundary, repeated part of image to avoid the places where the building are intersected, or the image 5,000 5, pixels or just clipped to 224 pixels? Uh, no, so uh, there is no additional boundary while clipping the images. What we are doing is uh, it's a sliding window based approach where we are clipping uh, in the factor of 224. So what will happen is uh, uh, we will be discarding the last few rows and few columns of the image from the big 5000 cross 5000 image. D does that answer your question? I hope you answered this question. Uh, and also, sir, I want to give an instruction to all the participants. And authors also like we are getting the questions from the participants, but we are uh, like we have less time. So I request all the participants to answer the question in Kubilo platform. Whoever is posting there, uh, we already posted in the dashboard, so they can answer their question and discuss further after the uh, session. Okay, so we move to the uh, next presentation, which is on power management of drones by uh, Mr. D S Vora from IIT Roorkee. Uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. I'll be sharing my screen now. Yeah. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. Yes. yes. So, uh, so first of all, a very good afternoon, a very good Friday to all of the uh, eminent personalities who are part of this UASG 2021. And I, uh, Dara Singh Bora, is a research scholar at IIT Roorkee, along with two of my mentors. It is Professor B. K. Gar and Professor S. K. Ghosh. Want to thank uh, the organizing committee for giving us this opportunity to present this paper titled Power Management of Roads. And now, before uh, making this paper, we did a lot of uh, literature review based on the recently published papers as far as the power management of drones are concerned, as you can see on the view file. Now, I'll be covering my presentation as uh, given in the view file. First of all, why power management is very, very important as far as drones are concerned. The number two will be how to choose a battery pack. Here, I will talk of a very prominent and very um, uh, very uh, useful battery which we use nowadays in eminence is the LiPo battery. That is in short, we call it lithium polymer batteries also. Then I will also talk of the principle of working of these LiPo batteries, what are the important characteristics. Then I will also throw some light on the alternates of these LiPo batteries at what are the solar powered drones, hydrogen powered drones. And if we are not using these batteries, then how to use the other alternatives? Then what is the relationship with size and weight? How to fly light? I will also cover the weather conditions in high altitude area, how to fly those drones. And at last the best practices which are there as far as these LiPo battery management is concerned. Uh, Mr. Vora, you have seven minutes only to finish everything. Yes, sir. So coming to uh, how to choose a battery pack. So as far as the battery packs are concerned, we generally see these three parameters. One is the voltage level, the second is the capacity, and the third is the discharge rate. When I say voltage level, then most of the time we will find that it is always given in the LiPo battery as 1S, 2S, 3S, 4S, 5S, and 6S. 
Here S is nothing but means the all the cells are in the form of series. One is means the nominal voltage of a LiPo cell is 3.7 volt. And if we charge it fully, then it becomes 4.2 volt. If we are using two cells in series, then we need to multiply it. So the maximum uh, voltage which uh, that those two electrochemical cells of LiPo battery gives us 8.4 volt, whereas uh, nominal voltage we get 7.4 volt. The second important parameter as given here in the view file is the capacity, which is always in the form of milliampere hour. So if say we are using a battery of 5000 milliampere hour, it means five ampere current can be drawn from it uh, continuously. Then the next parameter, which is very important, is the discharge rate. It is always given in the form of C. When we say 50 C, it means 50 multiplied by the capacity. C here gives us the capacity. So if you see the slide here, uh, this slide, if you can see on the view foil, 50 C. So 5000 milliampere is the capacity and the discharge rating is 50 C. So if you multiply 50 into five, so it means 250 ampere is the maximum current that can be drawn from this particular LiPo battery. Again, from this, you can see 2S means two batteries are in series. And if you multiply this uh, 3.7 into two, we get 7.4 of nominal voltage. As far as the LiPo battery principle of working is concerned, you can see there are two important processes. One is intercalation and the second is deintercalation. Here in the similar manner as in the normal battery happens, the charges flow from cathode to anode the flow of electrons takes place. The important thing which is, uh, which is need to be uh, seen here is the kind of a separator. The separator here is always in the form of a gel. Since it is in the form of a gel, it is not in the form of a liquid, so it is more secure in nature. There are less chances of it catching fire if we compare it with lithium ion cell batteries. So this is as far as the principle of working of lithium polymer batteries are concerned. Now coming to the various alternates of LiPo batteries, we have seen uh, we know about these hydrogen power drones. These are the cells which provide uh, three times the flight endurance and it maximizes the productivity, it minimizes the downtime and more flight of drones can be achieved if we use these hydrogen power drones. The second thing which is uh, in research is the change of battery while flying. If you see this particular uh, picture, which is in the view file, you can see there, there is a small drone behind the bigger drone. So the smaller drone, the moment it sits on the deck of this, um, uh, the bigger drone, it provides us that particular power. So this, uh, the bigger drone doesn't have to come back to the earth to uh, replace the battery or to get a battery which is more charged. So this kind of a scenario, which is there, you will find in case of aeroplanes are concerned. So this is an area which is under research presently. Apart from this, these are the various drone charging stations which are uh, which uh, which which you will find in us and in other european countries where the base structure connects to the power grid and there is a connector which extends from the base structure it also there is a there is a charging interface which is compatible with the uh, charging port of the drone it provides us that drone the drone sits over these uh, stations and get power so by doing this the drone doesn't have to come back to the earth station so these are also under research and a lot of papers and a lot of uh, research is going on as far as these drone stations are concerned. Now coming uh, to uh, the alternate, that is solar powered drone. If you see this particular drone, the gallium arsenide cells are there on the top of this particular drone. So the moment this drone flies, th this battery keeps on getting charged. And if, uh, the, if the sunlight is there, this will give us more flight. And if uh, the drone is, can fly higher, can sustain longer, it can give us better results. And now this is very important and this slide I want to highlight certain uh, uh, things. Like first is in the high altitude area, the drone has to, uh, the more battery gets used because the propeller size is more, because the density, the air density is 16% less as far as the higher altitude areas are concerned or where the cold conditions are there. So in that case, the propeller needs to be of, of the bigger size so more power uh, is required. So we, whenever we are flying a drone, so weather conditions need to be considered. If it is a, if it's a cold condition, it's a wind condition, what kind of precipitation is there? So all this makes us uh, that kind of environment to fly a drone. So if we see uh, the weather conditions, the severity of the weather conditions, then we can, we can make out that there, uh, we can divide the conditions into three main conditions. The first one is the moderate condition, when the visibility is less. The weather types can be fog, haze, glare, and cloud cover. The adverse conditions are there 
when the, there is a loss of communication, the loss of control, and a lot of wind and turbulence, rain, solar storms take is, is going on. Where in severe conditions where lighting, hail, tornadoes, and all. So in, in those kind of weather conditions, you should not fly a drone. Because even if your battery has been charged fully, the, the drone will not be able to sustain longer and will not give you those kind of results. And at last, I like to highlight the best practices of the LiPo battery management. We must charge a LiPo battery fully. It means it, if it is one cell LiPo battery, then we must charge it to 4.2 volt. Then we should never charge, never discharge the battery below a nominal voltage of 3.7 volt. It should never be a, a case where uh, it should reach a dead stick condition, as you can see at, at point number five, that it is a disaster condition. The drone will not be able to fly. Apart from it, if we are not using a, a LiPo battery, then we at that at that point of time also we must dispose that battery carefully. We always keep these LiPo batteries at room temperature. With this, I have come to the end of my slide. In case of any questions, I request you to please ask. Thank you for your kind attention and giving me this opportunity. Mr. Bora, it's a very important topic uh, when we are talking of the power management, not only for drones, but any device which requires you know, battery. So a lot of research is going on and you have chosen a very good topic uh, for presentation. So the questions are open for audience. And... Uh, Co-chair wants to ask any question. No, sir. <laughs> so, participants, audience, any question? Sir, there is no any question from participants. Yes. Okay, there's nothing. So, we move on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vora. Thank you we very much, sir. Thank you, sir. To the next presentation, which is on CNN-based automated weed detection system for UAV imagery from Muhammad Anul Haq, Majmai University. Hello, sir. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Fine. Hello. Nice to see you. I hope all of you are doing well. So, uh, first of all, I want to uh, convey my sincere gratitude to uh, the whole committee, including Professor Kamanjan and all the members who have done really best effort because from last one year, I have attended so many conferences and the management of this conference is, is one of the best. So, with that, Mark, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to discuss the CNN-based automated weed detection system for UAV imagery. And the content I am going to discuss are the introduction, and then I'll discuss the data and methods which we have used in this research. Then some information about accuracy assessment, followed by the result and discussion. And then I'll try to, because the time is very less, so I will uh, try to compare the results with some uh, uh, already developed studies uh, and the limitations and finally I will be, I'll be discussing the conclusion. So our, across the globe this problem of weed is one of the major issues that farmers are facing uh, I mean everywhere in the world and it can be problematic because those weeds are competing with the uh, other crops or we say the very crops for uh, basically for food, for space and for light. So weed are basically not crop is specific, but it can be of different types like perennials, annual and biannual. So the perennials one are the most uh, difficult one to suppress. So in normal terminology, we say weed is a kind of uh, unwanted uh, kind of plant or, or species which is there in our crops, cropping system and it is problematic for farmers. So in the current study, we have tried to develop CNN LVQ model uh, so in uh, with CNN, uh, we have tried to use the LVQ model in uh, synthesis to identify the broadleaf weeds. Uh, data set used in the current investigation is taken from uh, the Sontos, uh, which is there with 400 UAV imagery and those imagery were captured by the DJI Phantom 3 professional from 4 meter altitude and having a GSD size of 1 centimeter. So for further information about the data in detail, you can refer to Dos Santos, which is there in the reference. And we have for this 400 images, there are segments actually. Uh, segments uh, for uh, which consist around 15,336 segment. And uh, then the data is split on a uh, trial and error basis actually, because if we have a very huge amount of data, then 
it will uh, not be a, a big issue like how we are dividing the data but anyway it's highly important how we just uh, splitting the data 80 20 ratio we are taking 70 30 why we are taking different ratios so again it's a trial and error uh, based approach and with the, the uh, deep neural network like in case of machine learning or in case of artificial neural network which is having shallow layer optimization is easy because of the time so i'm going to discuss the computation time and then for this particular work we have used python 3.8 keras and tensorflow backend were used so this is the data set raw uav imagery belongs to the broadleaf uh, so this first uh, column is basically the broadleaf which is a kind of weed and then grass soil and soybean so the method we have used CNN uh, along with the LBQ. So this is the uh, basically architecture we have used, the image uh, size we have uh, made for 200 into 200. And then we have used uh, four convolution layer, layer uh, then uh, followed by the batch normalization and ReLU function. And max pool were also used in between and dropouts were used to uh, overcome with the problem uh, to just dropping some of the weights in between so that we will uh, prevent we can prevent overfitting and then uh, this uh, fully connected lbq was used as a classifier which classified our data set into four type of category the broad leaf uh, uh, basically which is the weed here and then so have been grass and the soil samples so we have performed accuracy based on uh, loss and accuracy as well as confusion matrix and uh, these are the segmented images uh, which we got and this is the confusion matrix so here in this confusion matrix the soil samples are showing 100 percent of user and producer accuracy but uh, if we go for the further classes however the accuracy is good but for the broad leaf weed uh, we are getting around 97.50 percent of producer accuracy and user accuracy of 98.32 percent so here uh, we have uh, tried to got the overall accuracy, which is 99.44%. And based on the 30 epochs, we are we used different type of parameters, uh, like how to choose different type of optimization, how to choose different type of layer, how many number of neurons should be there, whether we should use a particular data split ratio or not. So, I mean, there are so many number of things, uh, you know, we can do. Here, grid search might be very good, but if we are having a limited computation, then it will be a very, uh, you know, difficult time to get the uh, best uh, version for uh, respect to the com uh, complexity, uh, which means like the time we are uh, taking as computing. So here we have tried to uh, compare our uh, work with other works, but here, it is uh, worthwhile to mention that it is subjective to compare the result of the current study with other existing study due to different boundary condition for every study. So they are using different type of, of method, different type of uh, data set, and they are having uh, totally different. So, but anyway, for uh, a kind of comparison, we have used different type of like decision tree, ANN, SSD, SVM, faster RCNN, Inception, ResNet, Random Forest, by different type, uh, different authors, and the proposed method in current study showed uh, an accuracy of 99.44 percent. Another study is there which use CNN on a very rich data set. The limitation I will discuss of this research in the uh, this slide. So one is the class imbalance issue because we have not procured our data. We have used the data which is already available uh, through Mendeley. We downloaded this data. And it's there uh, with GitHub as well. So computation time issue was one of the major challenge we uh, saw in this particular work, and which is very crucial whenever we are going for some real time system. So there either uh, like in previous presentation, one of the uh, researcher mentioned that if they are going to deploy with mobile type of solution, so we should have some sort of computation issue. Uh, like So in that case, it's better to either go for machine learning methods or we should have some sort of mobile uh, deep neural architecture so these are two limitations and conclusion are developed cnn lbq demonstrated promising results with the overall accuracy of 99.44 percent and the data set which is originally 400 images were 
segmented uh, into 15,336 images of soil, soybean and broadleaf and results were compared with machine learning and DL applications used for wheat classification. And the future scope of the work will be to collect more images for different area for different type of wheat. Then we are trying to make crop specific wheat analysis for uh, our uh, area of study. These are some of the references which we have used in this work. And uh, I'll be happy if you have some questions to ask. Very nice presentation, uh, Mohammed Anil, and uh, very useful mm -hmm. uh, from agriculture point of view. Uh, this because this is uh, one big problem in the agriculture sector: how to identify the weed and how to remove the weed from the uh, crops. Um, just one, uh, you know, since you are doing uh, very good research, just uh, for future, uh, it just came to my mind that. Uh, uh, you have taken here 400 images to yes, sir. Uh, right so can we because there are actually people who are working in this area how can we get uh, uh, higher accuracy with the minimum number of images so if you reduce the number of images like from 400 you go to 300 from 300 you go to 250 then 200 and see what is the impact on the accuracy ultimately that means what is the optimum number of um, training samples or the uh, photographs which are required to train the algorithm. So that is also a, a research problem uh, for all of us that what is that optimum size, what is that minimum number? Exactly. Sir. Yeah, yeah. This will be so, a good future scope. Like yeah, that's right. The number of yeah. uh, data set. Right. Yeah. Uh, I can see one question from the chat box from Poland. Uh, yes, sir. Can we read? Yes. Yeah. Are you sure about use to GST? I think that is in presentation was omission because the GST of Phantom three pro uh, from four meter while will four meter will be one seventy two mm, not about one centimeter. Okay. So as I mentioned that we use this data set. So according to the paper published by Dos Santos, which is the reference number one in the current investigation. Uh, we got information from there, like the GSP is uh, is one uh, centimeter for that particular data set. And uh, like, you are correct, uh, I will check it again uh, for that particular uh, paper. But it was mentioned in that particular paper that the GSD size is uh, one centimeter. So that's why we are just uh, taking from that particular uh, paper. Dr. Hey, Suresh. Suresh. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. sir thank, thank you, sir. sir. Thank and uh, when you compare with the previous works of other papers which you have taken, they also have taken the UV images or uh, different other images they have taken? So, majority of them uh, have used uh, uh, UAV images. Majority of them. Some of them used other imagery like uh, uh, synthesis of uh, satellite data as well as UAV data. Okay. Thank you. But they have especially for uh, disease in the uh, uh, like crops and weed of classification basically. of disease identification like that based on that they might have yeah yes thank you sir thank you so much thank you sir. okay so we uh, thank you very much uh, we move over to the next uh, paper which is on high speed wi-fi systems for long range fanets real problems experiments and lesson learned by utkarsh ahuja from a startup yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Utkarsh, and my topic will be high speed Wi Fi systems for long range fanets, real problems, experiments, and lessons learned. So, uh, so this will be our outline. Uh, we'll start with a probabilistic view of the systems, and then we will discuss about the problem phase so far, and then experiments and the final the lessons learned. So, uh, the probabilistic view occurs as follows uh, We have a very simple idea, which is effective implementation of a communication network. So the idea is to find and identify factors that will improve and reduce the chances of successful communication between fanets. Now fanets are flying ad hoc networks, all sort of drones, UAVs are all fanets. So then after that, we would uh, grasp the habits or protocols that will maximize, maximize the likelihood of a strong connection. Uh, we keep it simple, so no co complex equations to solve. We'll not show any complex equations here. 
So we start with a simple open field. Firstly, we know that the power radiated from an antenna falls with increasing distance uh, from its originating antenna, following reverse square law. Thus, uh, let's say that the probability of connection at distance d is a function of d itself. Okay. So we can see this as uh, so. Here is at the bottom. There is a left side at the bottom. There is an antenna, and p of d will be seen as a surface or or a flux where the probability of connect connectivity at distance d is p of d. And then uh, distance after that, which is d plus x, the probability will be at p of d plus x. So uh, this function will be uh, inversely with proportional to uh, to the distance and maybe uh, to the proportional to the square of x, right? So we say that the p of d will be greater than p of d plus x, and so we calculate here as simple uh, in an integral format the the p of x dx, uh, which is the difference between uh, the two uh, two distances. So we give this equality, we give we give this quantity a value t, and we will find out what other factors are affecting the value of t. Okay. So other factors, which are uh, if the area in which this experiment is conducted such that there are small pollen, husk, and dust particles that sway with air, then my scattering phenomenon will alter the signal strength. Thus, the chances of successful communication will drop with a function p of lambda s. Well, lambda is the wavelength of the communication frequency, and in our case, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, and s is the particle size. So now, our value of t is increased as t will be equal to uh, p of d minus p u minus d plus x. Then probability of my scattering will be added. So as a schematic, I'm just showing it like that. So all the multiple values will be added, and then effectively we will calculate the value of t. So problem faced so far in communication network is long range limitation, even though systems are configured for it. people say that we have long range communication but they have and low data speeds is another factor that we have a problem about there is lesser reliability sudden connectivity issues software configuration is another problem and hardware failure is final problems so experiments that were conducted there were multiple experiments done in open field with which we developed some habits we say these habits when maintained can help in those conditions that we experimented in for example uav flows in commercial fire regions so for example uh, many of the other participants told about fire problems and some of them told about uh, power problems how do we care about powers and how does communication uh, will be a factor uh, operating in that power conditions so does the paper discusses all the experiments and gather factors after uh, that affect communication so our first experiment was to was a simple uh, uav swarm system in open fields so the material that was used is a simple flight controller socc which is a system on chip computer Wi-Fi modules, Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz router, uh, GPS receiver, 2.4 G Wi-Fi repeater, UAVs, uh, airframe motors and propellers, and all sort of stuff. So this is our experiment table. The first experiment was keeping Wi-Fi module near the propellers. The signal strength uh, falls drastically. That was our observation. And so probability function uh, where p p is uh, p of R e where probability is dependent upon Reynolds number. do reynolds number then can be depended on distance between the uh, flow and the antenna where the flow is in the line of sight from the router to the antenna of the wifi module and then keeping wifi module near high current cables a lot of interference is seen thus the data delivery falls drastically so p of di by dt which is uh, current i is current where probability is dependent upon changes current with respect to time and then after that we did the experiment electronics with same antenna and wifi properties but not switched on kept near the wifi module so data speed fall due to electronic interference uh, this, this is because of the fact that there is still some circuitry that completes in between and then they start to receive or start to dissipate energy through resistors in between so p electronics off is the probability that we say it's a fixed probability it will not change with time uh, this is by which the connectivity falls uh, experiment the other experiment we did is uh, electronics with the same antenna and wifi properties but this time it is switched on and kept near the wifi module so in this we observe cross talking uh, so data speeds fall even more due to the electronic interference as well as frequency interference or sideband frequency interference here we say that p electronics on plus uh, p s of t and n to the n cap is a fixed probability by connectivity falls here s of t is a time dependent point in vector in the direction of radiation and n cap which is the unit vector in the direction of radiation that is used for communication 
okay so the next experiment we did was the wi-fi modules kept in faraday cage so it is usually seen that people on ground uh, and ground stations they actually try to keep uh, small nettings around them to be safe from the flying uavs if they fall on it so there are multiple fences around the area to you know safeguard from the flying uavs so in that case uh, data speeds and signal strength fall drastically thus also the range reduces so p faraday case another probability is a fixed probability of the loss in signal if there are fast flowing winds that changes its direction or if there are high speed fans used in the summer that are swaying the net then this probability becomes a function of time p faraday cage ds by dt where ds is a deformation of the net this could be averaged out as before since the frequency or motion of the net is not comparable to the frequency of the electromagnetic wave that is being used so other experiment that we did was unregulated power supply to wifi module this burns up the chip and burns up the uh, modules that are being used so probability of failure is one so please do not do that right so the another experiment with this hopping data over the fanet node so basically we are trying to hop the data so chances fall with the greater number of hops since the uh, uh, since the communication can be considered as a bernoulli's random process thus probability of failure is p minus 1 minus p success at 2.4 g and 1 minus q success at 5 g where p and q are successes uh, at to at 2.4 gigahertz communication and 5 gigahertz communication respectively so basically i was saying that one one fanet is communicating over the 2.4 gigahertz if they are transmitting data over to socc it is storing that data and then it's transferring that data over the 5g network to the other node and that 5g node is receiving that data and this is all done through a simple through a simple uh, access point which has been made in the air by making one of the drones or one of the uavs as an access point so other experiment nodes are separated with buildings in between line of sight is visible because of the glass in between glass is standard and stuff in this is the experiment uh, condition the observation that we had the problem increases when the line of sight is obstructed by the building materials so p glass p walls p people and p of uh, other materials in the building at the moment to quantify these probabilities it tedious thus we say the all the sum as p building usually this value is quite large so it is ex uh, they expected that if you have one drone at one side of the building and the other side of the building the communication will be a lot of problem so it's better than to have communication around the building now how do we do that is very well explained in the paper and it's uh, and it's actually achieved in its uh, functionality so next experiment we did was a router or nodes near the iron pole so signal strength falls drastically so you can try this at yourself you can take your wifi module or something near to a filled metallic uh, uh, material and you can keep your met, uh, the block of metal around it and then you see that there is a drop in your wifi signal so we say that p of xc and xh for further clarification we say there is one of the video which is available on youtube that you can see and that will help will be able to help you how this concept happens and it's very prevalent so this x of e and x of h are electric and magnetic susceptibility so probability function then depends upon these values so the next uh, experiment that we did is fire household and forest place near wifi modules such that the smokes and flames interfere in the line of sight so usually people are saying that we are flying uh, uavs in the forest fires or trying to take images so what is the probability there you can lose your communication so denser and hotter the smoke more connection losses along with loss of signal strength so if the particle size of smoke is comparable to the wavelength it causes my scattering and also you will have a noisy signal in this case we prefer a completely autonomous system flying through uh, through uh, through a laptop using 2.4 gigahertz 5 gigahertz wifi is a bad idea so pmst where probability is governed by multiple scattering theory this is very well discussed in the paper and given references to also so uh, the other experiment we conducted was testing the system in rain so one of the other uh, participant also told about uh, um, power problems in rain so here we were experimenting in for the communication in rain and we were able to do the experiment so no problem with the batteries so what the observation was noisy signal uh, greater the size of uh, drop greater will be the travel path of the light so greater is a possibility uh, of internal reflection that loses the signal strength so basically if the uh, the droplet size is greater then there is more chance of internal reflections of the emr spectrum so all of this is being governed by the p of mst which is multiple scattering theory and then other two experiment following that are also conducted using the same theory so testing the system in fog same as above testing the system in snowfall creates permanent blockages in race path 
So then the, we did the experiment testing the system with crowd in between. So usually uh, UAVs are flown in crowds or for in party areas or uh, basically uh, in, uh, in in finally in in, in uh, colleges where we have uh, you know fests and uh, among those people uh, UAVs are also flown there. So what uh, observation do we have there? So people have a sweat glands that act as helical antenna because of the because of their shape they are made in, and it can interfere with the wavelength. So P animals is again a probability. Uh, again, measuring this value is a nightmare. Thus, the research that governs helped a little only to reason why people shouldn't be present in between. So there is one of the research uh, which is referenced in the paper itself. So how to reduce it? This is all of the values we are trying to con uh, say that are uh, coming to the values of T, are contributing the values of T. And how do we reduce it? So how to reduce it is a very simple idea. The idea to reduction of value T is vastly discussed in the paper due to time limitation. We cannot discuss it here, but we project the doings done and could be done. So probability uh, P of D, the, the range in the open field must be tested and confirmed during experiments. And uh, P of lambda is, which is switching to longer wavelength helps. This is for my scattering only. <clears throat> P of RE, which is uh, under, if you keep the, uh, your your uh, module under the under the propeller or near the propeller and it is affected by air currents. So keep away the modules and their antennas such that they are in the direct airflow. P D I F D T, which is the because of the uh, change in current uh, carried out by the high high grade motors. Uh, keep all current uh, high current wires away. We should not uh, keep it close to the antennas. So P electronics off distance the electronics. P electronics on uh, keep multiple signal reception opportunities with antenna arrays. Uh, so okay. just the last slide. So P Faraday cage is a keep all communication system away and out of such sites. And uh, P of success, uh, uh, P of uh, this is uh, having to hopping over the network. We find sweet spot for hopping in given weather conditions. P of building communication should uh, usually be done around the buildings. And PO's magnetic susceptibility, keep away from ferromagnetic materials from antennas and the in line of sight. PMST, multiple scattering factor needs to be identified and if possible must be reduced. And P animals test and fly away from animals. So for the scope of these research, we find we need to find relations of T, uh, we need to find relations of values under T. If they are interrelated and time dependent, then we can make state space models with Markov chains. And then observe system state when the limit uh, when the, uh, limit time reaches to infinity. Also, in other ways of they aren't related. Then uh, are they independent of one another? We need to find out that. Sometimes variables over which probability function depends are dependent on one another. In this case, then their time dependency isn't seen, but interdependency is observed. The other could be uh, quantifying values under T, which will be another scope of research and different problem statement. And currently, we use photon beam. Future research could be made on particles come for communication that don't interact with matter. For example, one of the research is being done for uh, neutrinos using for communication. So thank you all. I'll keep you with the, this as a last slide. If you have any questions, please, uh, I'll be happy to listen to them. Yeah, well, um, very nice presentation and a very nice piece of work which we are doing, Mr. Karsh Ahuja. This is a, uh, a typical, uh, really, you know, real problem uh, with the fanets and particularly when we are dealing with the swarm UAVs, uh, this problem arises. So you have touched upon a very important issue in this particular paper. Um, questions for the uh, yes, audience sir. participants, if there is any. From my side, yeah. yeah, because mainly when you are talking about the Wi-Fi, so here, uh, because it is in running mode, right? So this uh, drones will be in running mode and you are Mainly you are talking on scattering. My scattering is obviously it happened. But when scattering is there, what will be the attenuation? Have you worked on attenuation in the particular surrounding region? How so, sir, the fact, so the factor are very much dependent on the weather conditions. So basically, if you are talking about the attenuation, there is there's no way that I can say there is a generalized methodology. So there will be a way of testing it, but you cannot give the results and say that, okay, this is the result. This will also happen in that condition as well. So we have to cater about the factors, uh, all of that factors. I mean, spreading of uh, husk in the area, there are small smoke area, there's smokes. Uh, uh, AQI, you can talk about the air quality index at that point of time. Then you can talk about the fog or the mist which is present in the air. What is the, what is the humidity level of that, air, of that time? And then based on those all the factors, the attenuation occurs after a particular distance. 
so these okay. factors can uh, alter a lot but then uh, doing that part of research uh, requires a very high grade and very clean room to ex uh, do the experiment so i don't have that facility yet but then this is something which we can do in the future and this is something which i propose all the uh, people with very great facilities can do really now the people are looking in that direction also how exactly it affects that that also they were looking so right. if you add that also to this it will be good research work yeah of course sir, uh, we have some of the experiments with us as well we are doing in the, in that direction the other part will be to using antenna arrays for maximum likelihood of communication and then pheromone signals to have quicker communication based on that we can have artificial ai based models yeah, and that could predict where you are going in the which direction you are leading to and then we have uh, images pro processing in that factor as well so this, based this on the to a yes, single yes. dashboard Yes. Too. Yes. Yeah. We have we have been working on that, sir. We are actually working on softwares on that purpose as well. So right. file transfer could be done from FTP protocol in this process. Uh, otherwise, uh, the communication or the acknowledgement receiving can be done basically on IC, I, TCP IC, IP protocol only. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, sir. Uh, any other question from the uh, audience? Sir, there is no any questions from audience. We can move. To okay so thank you very much uh, utkarsh ji we move to the next presentation which is on comparison of dem generated from uav images and icsat one elevation data sets with an assessment of the cartographic potential of uav based sensor data sets by asutosh bharadwaj from iirs dehradun Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Are you able to uh, see the uh, slides? Yes, sir. Yes. Please put in uh, full, full mode. Yeah. Full presentation. Full presentation. Yeah. yeah. One minute. Okay. So, good evening again to the honorable chair, co-chair. the esteem conference organizing team members and the august gathering attending this important conference i am uh, dr ashutosh bhardwaj scientist engineer at photogrammetry and remote sensing department at indian institute of remote sensing dehradun i am presenting our work which explores the potential of uav optical data sets uh, while comparing it with the openly accessible uh, data sets like the icsat and the tandemx my other team members are shri surendra kumar sharma and uh, dr sharma gupta who are scientist engineers at urban and regional studies department iirs the title of the paper is uh, comparison of dm generated from uv images and i set one elevation data set with an assessment of the cartographic potential of uv based sensor data sets the outline is uh, first we have the introduction so i will just quickly go to that so currently uh, what has happened that the scenario has been totally revolutionized by the uav with the availability of the very high resolution remote sensing data sets so what do we mean by the vhr uh, remote sensing data sets is that the spatial resolution is uh, better than 1 meter so in this case uh, recently what we have seen we have uavs uh, with the optical sensors which are providing us the data sets with the a very very nominal uh, spatial resolution of 2 to 5 cm and in certain cases uh, better than that up to 5 mm uh, we are getting the spatial resolution which is uh, very high as compared to the data sets which we have been handling in routine uh, for last uh, two decades uh, if i say after the launch of uh, iconos in uh, the 1999 and 2000 time and uh, the cartosat 1 with 2.5 meter spatial resolution with the stereo data sets so primarily uh, while handling those data sets which were of the order of uh, meters now we are talking about few centimeters and uh, coming to a situation like 5 mm so there is a lot of change in the photogrammetric scenario uh, with the quality which is there with the output products of photogrammetry and the accuracy which uh, they are providing to us so it's very much possible to provide uh, and uh, 
generate digital elevation models with a very high accuracy, uh, resulting in highly accurate ortho images, which are useful and uh, required for the mapping purposes. So in the current study, uh, we have explored the uh, UAV data sets, which has used the VRS RTK GNSS uh, while flying and compared uh, its elevation with the ISET-1 and the Tandemax mission, which is uh, nearest to the UAV data sets among the satellite-based uh, data sets. Uh, all others are uh, relatively away from this, but these are the nearest to it. So the experimental site has been taken at the Yerden Les Bains, which is the municipality in the canton of Waud in uh, Switzerland. So the highlighted portion here, uh, it shows the study area. So it's a very good uh, interface with the open altimetry web-based portal where we can select the study area and uh, these uh, dots, what you see here, they are the footprints of the ISET one data set, which is a 70 meter footprint at a distance of 175 meter apart. So the ISET one data sets has also been taken for this study area. And the data set, UAV data set comprises of 235 uh, true color RGB images acquired from the SODA, that is the sensor optimized for drone applications, which has been flying at uh, an altitude of 106 meters, providing an average GSD of 2.64 centimeters. So that's a, a very high spatial resolution data sets, uh, which are now available. So this is the metrology uh, flow chart, which shows the UV data set and its processing through the stereo pairs, which are there in the UV data sets and the bundle block adjustment using the exposure station uh, coordinates uh, while generating the digital elevation model and the ortho mosaic. At the same time, the pre-processing has been done for the pandemics data set and the ISET uh, elevation data sets, which has become very easy in the current scenario due to the uh, very effective and user-friendly GUI, which are provided by these two data providers of uh, uh, from NASA for the ISET and the DLR for the tandem X. And these data sets has been compared here. So the digital elevation model and the ortho mosaic has been generated in the PIX4D software after the bundle block adjustment uh, without the ground control points. So that, that is one uh, important thing which is to be noted here. Uh, along with the VRS RTK GNSS, which has been utilized during the data acquisition. And uh, since that ISET-1 data set uh, is on the Topex uh, positive on, uh, ellipsoid, uh, so that has been brought to WG-74 uh, datum for comparison with the Tandemax as well as the UV-DEM. So this uh, screenshot basically shows the a boundary overlaid on the Google Earth and the study area available on the open altimetry site, along with the ISET footprint, uh, which are there. And this is the zoomed version of that. So now the, this shows the entire thing that how the UAV data sets has been collected for this uh, study area with the presence of the ISET footprint on this and uh, making us analyze the elevation for this area at these uh, ISET locations. So if we click any of the ISET points, uh, as I was telling, so it's now very easy to get the details of the ISET footprint. And with the simple right click, we can uh, download the CSV file uh, for the set of the ISET footprints in the study area. So it's a very, uh, interactive and uh, useful, easy to handle GUIs to obtain the data from an open source platform. And uh, this slide shows the Tandemx TM, which has again been overlaid uh, with the uh, boundary and the ISET footprint. So finally, what we are doing is that we are uh, comparing all the elevation values uh, because in the topographic modeling, elevation is one of the very important uh, entity or the data, and since various uh, modeling uh, researchers, they are using the DEM for such as the uh, 
uh, soil erosion for uh, flood mapping they are, they are want the topography so this uh, uav data sets are providing very high uh, precise digital elevation models so the nearest ones to that uh, that is the iset one has been utilized here and we can see that that it's providing uh, this delta is represent the difference between the uav dm that is the htm and the hi set that is the uh, elevation received from the i set data so this is the difference so we can see here we are receiving very high uh, accuracy and uh, we have a very less difference between the i set dm values and the uh, uav dm values so that is the uh, 19 cm in the open plain ground and 35 cm and wherever we see that the deviations are more such as 16 meter here they are because of the presence of the building because the i set footprint is of 70 meters so it includes the ground uh, open ground uh, some few trees are there and then the building is also there so at such locations the difference in height is more otherwise at all other locations we see that the differences are uh, quite less there are other issues definitely because this uh, study is from the open source data set and uh, the uh, ground gcps are not there in the study so that forms one of the limitation but the two technologies which are there uh, currently in remote sensing the space bond lidar and the uav dm so they are found to be very uh, nearby and provide us a hope for a uh, very accurate modeling in the coming days because currently the uav uh, data sets are uh, not available for all the places and uh, it is restricted uh, most of the times but you can see that what it is capable of so it is uh, in this study it is uh, pr uh, providing an accuracy in the geolocation that is uh, 2.73 meter in x as well as y and in z it is 3.46 centimeter so within a pixel or two pixel uh, level we are receiving the vertical and the horizontal accuracy so that's a very high accuracy with the rmsc of 1.7 centimeter in x 2.27 centimeter in y and 2.31 centimeter so all of them are within a pixel so it provides a very high accuracy for any type of uh, utility management or facility management purpose and uh, such kind of uh, uav data sets uh, are capable of uh, generating uh, large scale maps of the order of uh, 1 is to 250 to 1 is to 300 so this is the kind of uh, level of mapping where what we can achieve using the uav data sets so that has uh, been explored in this uh, study uh, with the vrs rtk gnss which has been used here with the post processing kinematic uh, method uh, utilized for the uav data sets so primarily what we intend to showcase here is that the it's a highly accurate uh, dm what we are getting from the uav and this shall be used in the coming days for uh, important applications such as uh, flood hazard zonation and similar to that in the coming time and with the new policies which are coming in for the uav it will be easily available for us to get the data sets i said two has also been planned but by chance in this uh, area i said two data footprints were not available so with this small presentation uh, i would uh, say my make my last point that uh, what uh, this uav technology is providing is a very great platform uh, to get a very high spatial resolution data with high accuracy and compatible gnss accuracies which uh, uh, yet we are not able to achieve by very uh, other methods. The nearest method is aerial photography uh, to that. So thank you very much. Any questions are there? So I would also thank the data providers and... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashutosh Bharadwaj. Very good study, very useful because DEM uh, nowadays are used in very large number of applications because we have moved from 2D applications to 3D applications where DEM is playing very important role. So this is, was a very, very nice study. Um, any question from the audience? There is no any questions from the audience. Okay, there's one question, I think. This yeah. is a discussion, like uh, if the previous presentations, the answer to the 
question. No, there is no question. So, uh, for this, uh, yes, sir. For this presenter, there is no any question. Oh, right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashutosh. Thanks Thank a lot. You, so, we Thank move you. over to the next uh, presentation now, which is the last presentation. Perhaps UAV lidar and terrestrial laser scanner scanning for automatic extraction of forest inventory parameters uh, from Madam Khadija from Morocco. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Khadija Marawi from Morocco, and today I'm presenting new EV LiDAR and terrestrial laser scanning for automatic extraction of forest inventory parameters. Unmanned aerial vehicle remote sensing techniques have proved its usefulness in forest inventory applications as well as for ecological purposes. And in this context, the UAV LiDAR system has become a promising technology and is starting to be used often for forest management due to its ability to provide very accurate estimates of the three-dimensional structure of the forest. Sustainable forest management implies knowing how to characterize and specialize the forest resource. Historically, the methods used to collect this information uh, consist of carrying out conventional inventories and still used in a lot of countries. For this, it is imperative to raise the following questions. What are the advantages of using UAV LiDAR and terrestrial laser scanning forestry? And what parameters can we extract from the UAV and terrestrial LiDAR data? The main objective of this work is to study the potential of the UAV LiDAR and terrestrial scanning for improving forest inventories, especially for the extraction of the, dendro for the dendrometric parameters. The study area for the UAV LiDAR consisted of three different regions, a Mediterranean forest in Morocco located, of the, uh, located at the forest of Mamora, the second and the third point cloud represents a coniferous forest in California, and the last ALS point cloud represents a tropical forest in Congo. For the TLS data, it consists of a set of, uh, of, a set of deciduous trees. The first UAV LiDAR data was obtained in July 2017 with the Velodyne sensor. The second and the third were acquired by Candoron, and the last one from Yellow Scan. The TLS data represents a plot with deciduous trees and was, and was downloaded from the website of the computer platform. In our study, we suggest a methodology based on the first segmentation of ALS point cloud followed by a second segmentation of TLS point cloud on the plot level. The first segmentation will provide a delineation of individual crowns for which we extract some attributes, while the second segmentation aims to delineate individual trees and from which other than dendrometric parameters are to be automatically extracted. The ALS point cloud segmentation with Sigma and watershed algorithms show, shows different results. For the California data set, it was found that it presents several quadrants of different densities. We therefore pro proceeded to a division in order to treat each quadrant so as to see the robustness of the proposed algorithm. For the TLS point cloud, this, we tested two approaches of segmentation. The first one is automatic, and the second one need uh, manual editing. Different other than dendrometric parameters are to explore from TLS point cloud. For example, we have tree position. This parameter is very important because it is from the planimetric position that all the dendrometric parameters will be measured. DBH, using RHC and LSR algorithms. H, also using RHC. The same curve, the results are in the form of a list of diameters corresponding to each H of the curve. Concave and convex hole, and another example of dendrometric parameters that we can extract from TLS data. In order to validate the results of the ALS point cloud, we established the manual extraction of certain crowns on the CHM, and we extracted manually dendrometric parameters from TLS data. So we can pair the results between, between manual and automatic extraction for attributes.
Our study focuses mainly on providing a methodology that provides an alternative that can allow the forest manager to easily, automatically, and more accurately measure forest inventory parameters. Results concerning the ALS data confir uh, confirm that the different segmentation methods lead to very different results. In general, the performance of the methods is better in the coniferous forest and the forest of Mamora, characterized by an average density of trees. Also, Sigma was enabled to delineate overlapping crowns, but watershed did. For the GBH measurement, RHC and LSR algorithms both displayed almost one to four centimeters deviation from, uh, from the reference and H uh, was extracted with one to eight millimeters. To conclude, we can say that the study affirms the potential of integrating new AV and terrestrial laser scanning forest inventory operations. It gives the undeniable advantages in terms of cost and time reduction. The results obtained demonstrated the effectiveness of the algorithms in segmenting points cloud with uh, some differences depending on the type of the forest. For future work, we will focus on the adaptation of the segmentation algorithm to the nature of the studied forest, especially in the case of uh, dense forests. Spectral information or lighter intensity to integrate in order to potentially improve segmentation results and individual to crown segmentation using deep learning. And thank you. Well, very, very, very nice uh, study uh, for automated extraction of the forest uh, parameters from uh, airborne laser scanner and terrestrial laser scanner. Just one curiosity with me, uh, whether these two data sets were used independently, you never combine them uh, and uh, try to use in an integrated way, both the data sets. They were used independent. For the independence of the two data sets, we proposed uh, firstly a combination but the existence of independent regions makes uh, made us uh, just made, make it as a recommendation. So we just proposed a methodology, uh, a particle uh, theoretical part, which is a, uh, a combination. But in the practical part, we just uh, use two independent regions. Right, but uh, I have read a few papers where uh, when they are studying in three D. You know, environment. Even suppose you have to create a 3D model of the forest area, then both the data sets are combined together because they are complementing and supplementing each other. But nonetheless, this is a very good study, yeah. uh, very useful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, audience, if uh, there is any question, please. Uh, sir, no questions from audience. Dr. Suresh? Okay, no questions. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. Kadija, for nice presentation. Okay, now our yes, sir. organizing team, whether we have finished all the presentation, anybody yes. left? No, sir, all the presentations are completed are by in the time. I thank you and uh, co-chair, sir, for making the session uh, peaceful and uh, providing the, uh, your uh, expert reviews. I would, I would like to thank uh, uh, co-chair, um, uh, Dr. Suresh Margu and uh, uh, all the presenters. Uh, the presentations were excellent, very nice, very informative, and gave us uh, different different applications. And also the the team, uh, uh, organizing team of the conference. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, sir. I thank all thank the participants for their presence. Dr. Dr. Yes, Dr. Suresh, yes, uh, uh, yes, Dr. Suresh, I give you my mobile number we will talk two minutes on the mobile nine yes, four nine four one two nine yes, nine four one two nine yes, nine nine two three seven yes sir thank you sir yeah so uh, we'll, we'll talk on phone so yes, if sir. you can give me a ring and we exit from here yes, so we complete good, the formality right good, sir. Sure, okay sir. good great thank you so thank much you. It's Thank my you, pleasure sir. to be with you, sir. To be with you, caring co chair as a co chair with you. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I thank all the participants. Uh, they've done a very wonderful job, totally, based on your research work, whatever you have done. You presented and you articulated in a well manner and you presented also in a particular time. And we finished uh, two minutes earlier as per the given schedule. And thank you so much. And all the best for your future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and thank, especially my sincere thanks to my guru, Dikhagat sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks for the thank organizing. You, thank you so thank much, you. much for organizing, organizing yeah, team, yeah. for giving this opportunity. Yes. So bye-bye. We are leaving. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. -bye. I thank, yeah, I thank all the presenters and participants. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pradima, ma'am, and every co-chair and chair and all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.